so thank you all for coming again. I'm Renata Egan and I'm on Bedigal land. Uh, I have the great pleasure today of introducing Susan Jeans. She's the chair of the heavy industry, low carbon transition CRC, known as the HILT CRC, and is also director of the Jeans Holland Association at Jeans Holland Associates and formerly on the board of ARENA. Uh, Susan has worked in the Australian renewable energy sector for more than two decades. Uh, I hand the floor to you now, Susan. Thanks, Renata. Is everything okay? Can you hear me all, all right? Yes, we can hear you and I think we'll go to your slides shortly. Thank you. Cool. Well, for someone who chairs a um, research body, a technical research body, like the hilt, I'm not technically savvy. So your guys have given me a fair bit of support today. Thank you very much. But, uh, and they will be managing my slides so that I don't um, mess it up. So um, yeah, this, if you'd like to start the slides, that'd be great, thanks. Um, I should start by saying that this is not a technical presentation. Uh, Gus Nathan, who is our research director and the, and the bid leader for the HILT CRC is giving a, a technical presentation later on in the day. So if you were looking for one of those, I hope you're not too disappointed. Um, my job is really to introduce the HILT and, and what it's about to you and to give the solar industry a chance to think about where it can connect with um, the work that we're uh, looking to do over the next 10 years. So the first slide, thanks. Uh, our, um, we are a very new organisation. We were uh, announced in the last round of the CRC um, announcements as a successful bid. And that was at the end of uh, June this year, we established as a company, Hilt CRC Limited in uh, August, and we actually formally commenced uh, work as a CRC on the 1st of November. So you might also excuse that we're still in the process of organising our websites, of coordinating things like um, templates for PowerPoint presentations. There's a few in here that are borrowed from, from older versions. <laughs> and um, we'll, but we'll, we'll have that all in train and up and running uh, in the next couple of months of the, of the new year. So please excuse that as well. So the HILT's sort of raison d'etre is heavy industry is responsible for 20, around 20% 20 of total emissions in Australia. And it's well known um, that the heavy industry um, emissions are very hard to abate. I think the heavy, heavy industry in Australia, we're looking at as uh, iron and steel, alumina and aluminium and lime and cement. So it's a rough calculation that that, uh, that group of sectors in Australia is responsible for around 20% of total emissions. Uh, the, if I could have the next slide, I can explain to you why those three sectors uh, work well together. Uh, you know, what the three sectors in common need is, is very high temperature carbon free heat. And so as we develop those technologies over the, over the or develop and adapt those technologies over the lifetime of the hilt, uh, we're, we're looking here at a sort of industrial ecosystem, um, circular economy type um, system, which is kind of exciting for, an, for a sector like the heavy industry sector where we can um, produce um, from green construction materials, um, byproducts from the aluminium and um, alumina sector, feeding them into cement and lime, getting CO2 from the, um, from the, the processing of uh, lime and cement, and then using that CO2 to make um, you know, renewable fuels. So we've got a net zero system, and in many ways, those three sectors are sort of in, potentially a lot more interdependent. And uh, that's kind of the exciting thing about this is that you wouldn't expect three such um, separate uh, sectors to, um, to be so interested in working with each other. Um, if I could have the next slide, thanks. Yes. Thank you. So every organisation has to have a vision and we've, um, like every other organisation, workshopped ours. And I think the, the, the vision represents the themes that come out from our research and our industry partners. Uh, we don't just want the heavy industry uh, sector to survive in Australia. It's been a debate over several decades as to how well it can cope in a, um, in a multinationally controlled uh, carbon constrained world. Uh, so we're looking at it not only surviving, but thriving over the um, coming decades with improved technical uh, cap uh, capabilities 
and, uh, and capabilities that enable cost competitiveness in this global green economy. Um, our objectives over the course of the, the, the lifetime of the Hilt is to demonstrate de-risk and provide the skills and, and uh, tools for the industry to optimise its decarbonisation pathways. And I think there's one, port, one important point here is that not only providing the tools, we're embarking on a fairly significant um, skilled worker process. We've got an agreement, agreement so far with TAFE SA and we're talking to uh, the other TAFEs around the country about adopting the similar program that we're developing with them. Uh, we're funding lectureships so that companies can have, uh, um, it can employ engineers and, and other workers who understand their technology needs and who understand the technology needs that um, are under development for them. As I said, it is a it, it is a 10 year journey and our biggest challenge over that 10 years is going to be to uh, staying at the forefront of global developments. We might not necessarily develop um, the, uh, the next hydrogen technology breakthrough in Australia, which is sad and I'll allude to that later. Um, but what we assume is that these developments will occur as the, as the hill progresses. Uh, and one of the more exciting developments for us over the last, uh, last few months since we were awarded the CRC status and funding is that the Australian government have come to us and said that uh, they are confident to join um, Mission Innovations Decarbonising Industry Working Group and that the Hill will lead that globally. Uh, it, will, it will cover industries more broadly than, than simply the three that we're involved with, but it's still a very exciting opportunity and many of the technologies that we'll develop ourselves or, and adapt ourselves um, will be relevant to other sectors. So we're extraordinarily excited about that. We will host the secretariat for the working group and we're co-chair, Australia co-chairs the working group with Austria, which kind of amuses me, Austria and Australia, what can go wrong in terms of, you know, understanding <laughs> around the rest of the world where, um, where we fit in that. Could I have the next slide, thanks. This is why many of the core partners, the core industry partners that we, um, we have joined up, and you can see from the list uh, in the Pilbara, that includes Fortescue, Roy Hill, Rio Tinto. Uh, in the southwest of Perth, we've got Alcoa, Adbri, South 32. Upper Spencer Gulf, we've got Liberty One Steel, and a number of our, um, our core and associate partners, or affiliate partners rather, are. Um, uh, active in this region as well. We've got Abri, Alcoa in um, Portland, We've got Grange Resources in um, in Tasmania, in northern Tasmania, and of course we've got Rio around the hydrogen hub too in um, in Queensland. So we're looking very much at this as a hub um, based CRC where common um, access to resources, um, and you'll see, I mean, anybody who's involved in the renewable energy sector, particularly the solar energy sector, knows about the wonderful solar resources we have in these regions around Australia. And so that outstanding um, coincidence of, of mineral resources and uh, renewable energy resources gives us an edge globally. And it's been a little frustrating, I guess, that it's taken us this long to get that recognised and to get action behind making um, those two sectors work together. Um, next slide, thanks. So uh, you've had the introduction to our core partners, um, the evolution of the Hilt and how they came, um, came on board, started with for those of you who have heard of the Centre for Energy Technologies at, uh, at the University of Adelaide. Uh, we have a very industry focused board. The first chair of the board was our former Premier, John Olson. The second chair was a former science minister at, um, in the RAND government, uh, Trish, Worth, uh, sorry, Trish Wright, who was also um, our interim CEO, and then myself. And we've all had a very strong view that the researchers at the, at the university need to understand the needs and the um, aspirations of industry. And so uh, Gus Nathan and his team at CET have a strong record of working well with industry. Uh, we have long-standing capabilities at CET. Um, I had to resign as chair of the board in order to take up the role at um, the Hill because conflict of interests are very important in this, in this process. Um, but the CET had a long established um, recognition of its capabilities. It established the High Temp Forum, which uh, brought researchers, uh, businesses, and policymakers from around the world to Australia for the first one in 2018. 
In 2020, we held one of the first virtual event, global events um, on March the 16th, just as COVID hit and people stopped traveling. Um, and our, our next one is um, to be, will be held here in Adelaide at the Wine Center, National Wine Center is part of the university's campus, a rather wonderful aspect for us, um, in September, as will the Hyped Forum. And the Hyped Forum is about um, um, accelerating the production of hydrogen technologies. And this is an area where I feel very strongly as we look around the country at what are the hydrogen opportunities for um, developing projects fueled by hydrogen, developing supply chains that we're really missing championing, championing a, um, an extraordinary opportunity globally. We've got a lot of expertise in our own universities and within CSIRO, and we should be talking a lot more about um, how we can drive new hydrogen technologies and meet the cost, um, the cost expectations over the next 10 years. I think that's something that we all need to be talking a lot more about and encouraging governments to consider this more um, enthusiastically. But the university uh, led the the bid and it reached out to its industry and its um, research partners. Our other core research partners are CSIRO, Curtin and the ANU. They have all extraordinary expertise in the, in the um, green steel, uh, the, green, the work with aluminium industry and the renewable energy technologies, developing hydrogen. We've got a, a marvelous group of research partners including the University of uh, Newcastle Swinburne and the QUT. They're not core partners, there are uh, sort of next level key partners, um, but they have also strong records in working with heavy industry. And it's a wonderful place to be. It's highly collaborative, uh, a highly collaborative environment. We're working with true believers in the potential. I mean, it's almost a, um, you don't lose sight of the fact that you truly believe in doing things that mitigate climate change, but you've also got to believe in the potential um, for the economic development that Australia can um, offer the world by developing our and, and adapting our technologies here. Can I have the next slide, please? So here's um, some of our, uh, here's a list of some of our, our leading research providers. As I said, the University of Adelaide, CSIRO, Swinburne, University of Newcastle. Um, we also reach out uh, globally to Mintech, for example, in South Africa. We're connected with um, um, Ger German Aerospace. We're connected with the University of Arizona, where they have some very exciting hydrogen um, uh, production technology uh, work happening. And uh, so we've got a global outreach, and a, which Mission Innovation now gives us an extra dimension to that global outreach. Um, next slide, thanks. We also have a number of industry transformation partners. So these are technology companies, and in many cases, in almost all cases, they're Australian um, technology um, developers, which is really exciting, not all, but most. Uh, we've got, Worley play a very active role in, the, in our process so far. We've got a wonderful representative from uh, Worley, an engineer called uh, Alan, um, and he is fantastic. He's like the grandfather of the group. He's very wise. Um, provides very, um, very level advice and works actively with us in encouraging um, us to believe in uh, what the, you know, what the, the sector can do. Uh, we also have strong attachment to Hatch. They've worked for a long time with the University of Adelaide, part of their network. Um, DRI technology, we, we're definitely going to need to uh, work with them to adapt their technology to many of the um, infrastructure um, owned, or too much of the infrastructure owned by many of our companies. And Calix is a really exciting um, Australian technology company that will look to capture the, the CO2 that we'll need to um, contribute to other industrial and chemical processes. Uh, we've also got hydrogen development companies, storage companies. So we've got a very wide range and a very wide range of Australian based companies, which is um, you know, extraordinarily exciting. Could I have the next slide, thanks. Slide, thanks. So as, as with everything, um, timing is, is pretty important. We were developing this uh, capability base. Uh, we were extending to other research and industry uh, organisations in the country, and we understood the development of the industry base. Um, and we understood the potential for um, a lot of these new technologies to be developed in Australia. I mentioned hydrogen production technologies and my, I suppose, a, a minor sense of frustration that they're not um, championed enough. And the other uh, technology that I think isn't championed enough and isn't um, uh, 
hasn't been has has a slow record of uptake in Australia is CST. I mean, we've got to look more seriously at the opportunities for CST for heat and power. Um, it's it, it provides sort of numerous um, income sources. Um, nobody's really been brave enough to stand up and say, we really need to start with this. I had, I suppose it's no secret for those of you who um, uh, who knew me that at Arena, I was rather frustrated. There wasn't a strong belief that CST can provide um, uh, cost-effective uh, energy into, this, into the systems, but someone's got to build one and show how it can. Um, we also see Australia contributing very widely to global emissions reductions outcomes. And that's again, reinforced by our role at Mission Innovation. Um, one of the really big opportunities and one of the big opportunities that brought in some of our core partners is that if we get this right, uh, we will be able to develop on shore uh, many of the raw materials that we send over are very poor sort of quality and very poor, poor um, prices when we could do that ourselves and, and send green products overseas that can participate in the, the burgeoning um, green global markets. So companies saw this and they, were, they saw the, the threat of um, not being able to participate in the green global markets if they didn't do something. And they also saw the upside of doing something. So this, this all came together in sort of 2018, 2019. We were so also seeing um, a growth around the world in shareholder interest in ensuring the long-term value for the companies that they'd invested in. So the time was right for the coordinated approach. And in last year's round uh, in February, we, we um, um, finalised our, our two-stage application process. And as I said before, we were successfully um, announced in June. So could I have the next slide, thanks? So this was the industry's challenge that it was facing. The world was decarbonising. Um, the government and industry knew that heavy industry is very important to the Australian economy and that without doing something, we would lose, um, we, to, uh, along the decarbonisation pathway, we would lose this industry and its competitiveness to Australia, which was estimated at around about a $44 billion loss to the Australian economy that we just couldn't take. Next slide, thanks. So if we break the circuit, these are the scenario uh, analysis, analyses that have been undertaken by our group through the development of the bid process. The very conservative modelling that you are required to use, the CRC impact model, showed that um, a, a fairly low benefit, but nonetheless a benefit, and uh, it showed 28 uh, 25,800 new jobs. And um, I suppose anyone who's been around politics for very long knows that jobs are very much things that drive um, um, politicians to action. And um, so everybody who has anything to, <laughs> to interest a government in talks about jobs. So even 25,800 new jobs are very important to Australia and, and good value for the money that, this, uh, that the government has invested in us. Um, we did a mid-range forecast, which was um, a lot more attractive, and we did an optimistic um, uh, range forecast, which considered a lot more um, opportunity to develop. The, it, it looked at where the mineral processing um, options were and the, um, and the value, the increased value in the exports, and that ultimately resulted in uh, 376,000 new jobs. Now, somewhere between 25 and and 376 isn't a bad number. So we expect that um, we're gonna be major contributors to the development of the heavy, uh, the decarbonised heavy industry sector in Australia and that it has very exciting um, impacts, particularly in regions. And regions of course are very important in the political debate and very important to regional economies. Um, could I have the next slide, thanks. So I just put a, um, uh, a sort of energy use diagram. I can't point to <laughs> where I'd like to show you, but um, to, the right of the on, to the right of the diagram on your screen, you can see how um, fossil fuels drive the development of the high temperatures that, um, that um, uh, companies need who rely, or, or industries need who rely on um, high temperature processing. And they're all from, nearly all from hydrocarbons. So we need to be able to provide not just a low temperature range, but we're looking at above 500, uh, 500 degrees um, Celsius. And we're looking to do that with uh, renewably sourced um, technologies. And so that is our challenge. It's not just going to be, we're not just gonna be able to provide heat, high levels of heat for 
um, iron and steel, aluminium and alumina and lime and cement, we'll be able to transition other sectors in Australia and indeed around the world um, if we are managing to develop and adapt those technologies to individual infrastructure that, um, that our members own. Um, next slide, thanks. Uh, I think it's, Gus will talk more about this later on this, this afternoon and be able to give you um, uh, more flavour, I suppose, around what we're actually going to do. Well, we have three programs. Uh, we have um, the process technologies. So they're technologies that are particularly focused at a single um, uh, installation and how to um, adapt them to the much higher temperatures that they're going to need. Uh, we've got cross-cutting technologies that are commonly used across all um, all sectors of the heavy industry. And we've got program three, which is facilitating transformation. And program three is um, perhaps the smaller in terms of the funding, but it's also very important um, that governments understand the developments that um, are being undertaken and what the policy ask will be of those. We're obviously uh, looking at, and we've been um, encouraged to consider by the Commonwealth what the technology innovation roadmap will mean for some of the uh, pilots and demonstrations particularly that we will do over the course of the next 10 years and particularly towards the end of the next uh, of the coming 10 years um, and governments are actively involved in this program the South Australian government leads um, leads the program along with Curtin University and we have uh, the Commonwealth the West Australian government all very active and uh, attending our um, many of our workshops and very interested to understand uh, what the ask of them will be. Uh, next slide, thanks. So our program leaders, uh, are, we've got an industry leader for every program so that any researcher who's worked with industry understands the tension, industry wants something um, and is, is perhaps a little concerned that their investment in the research will not give them what they want. So we've got a, a, a leader uh, from um, the industry sector and from the research sector. So uh, Roy Hill, um, the, the, co the company looking at the company operating in the uh, Pilbara region uh, is the industry leader, Andrew Beath from CSIRO. And I said before, CSIRO, a very important partner across the full range of activities we're doing in the Hilt. Uh, Felicity Lloyd from Adbro was our program two leader, but we've nabbed her and she's now our new CEO and we're looking for a replacement for her at that program. Uh, the research leader is Professor Peter Ashman from the University of Adelaide. Um, and as I said before, Richard Day uh, is the low carbon leader in the South Australian government. He is um, uh, the, uh, the industry leader of Program 3. Um, and so he's obviously very conversant with the way governments operate and what their needs are and very keen to ensure that the things that we'll need or the, the policies that we'll need are um, governments comfortable with. Next slide, thanks. Uh, uh, I, it really irritates me to think when people talk about silver bullets because they're not there. They're like they're like unicorns. They don't exist. Um, and talking to a solar industry um, conference, um, you've got solar uh, PV technologies, solar um, uh, concentrated thermal technologies. Um, you know that solar energy is very important, but it's not the only um, technology that we are looking to develop and that we need for the future. Um, and we will have numerous low technology, emissions technology options as we uh, consider developing and adapting um, them for uh, operating large, for powering large infrastructure. Um, there will be no one size fits all solution because every industrial facility is different and it will have different energy needs. And I sort of encourage you very much to think about how both sides of the solar sort of technology um, sectors can assist, can think about, um, work with industry to think about their time of day needs, the heat and power needs, uh, the energy services, we're replacing fossil fuels. Fossil fuels bring with them certain services that we can't pretend don't, we don't need. Um, what's the available infrastructure and space and the available energy sources. And certainly solar is going to figure very highly in those, um, those particular requirements. Next slide, thanks. And, just to sort of flesh them out a little bit more, the co-location co of solar resources and mineral resources, as I showed you before on the map, are huge opportunities. We'll need um, PV for electrification options, PV with storage, 
uh, solar fuels. Um, CST, as I said, has a huge potential for heat and power and CO2 reuse, which you know, is a major feature of, of our focus over the next 10 years, requires energy to make new products. Next slide, thanks. Um, we have uh, four outcomes that we must fulfill. We um, have agreed with the Commonwealth we will fulfill and um, our funding is, um, is paid on the, on the achievement of certain milestones and the milestones take us down these tracks. So we, uh, you know, our first um, outcome is near commercial low carbon technologies de demonstrated in industrial settings. So we have to get um, some projects to demonstration stage. And this takes out the uh, risk for, with, with all of the core and research companies, work, organizations working together, the risks and the adaptation become far more transparent and they're more confident to uh, take them up. Uh, our second outcome will be high value midterm technologies developed and demonstrated to pilot scale. Um, we must do a number of those. The example I've used is technology for green calcination to produce alumina, uh, lime and cement. Our next slide, thanks. Uh, for a uh, third outcome, longer term technologies developed to higher te uh, technology re readiness. And we will in some degree uh, do that on our own, but we'll be looking and assuming that the rest of the world develops some of these um, longer term technologies and we're looking at how we adapt them um, to heavy industry needs. Uh, outcome four, at least four roadmaps must be developed for specific industries in conjunction with uh, the companies working with uh, regional economies and state governments. States are very important, and as I said before, the regions are very important. And we also need to inform governments of the infrastructure needs if we plan on large um, growth opportunities in particular regions. They're going to have new infrastructure needs. What are they and how much will they cost and how do we co-invest? Um, next slide, thanks. So just <laughs> this, is a, this is a good example of how our templates are sort of playing up a bit at the moment. This is a University of Adelaide template because we just couldn't work, get it to work <laughs> to be blank on, on my system. Um, but this is just to introduce you to the other um, uh, people leading the hilt at this point in time. Um, I don't know if any of you have worked with Felicity Lloyd at, um, at Adbury. Um, she's an extraordinarily um, intelligent, bright and very well organised a uh, young woman, and we're really excited to have her on board. Um, many of you will know Gus Nathan. He's our research director, the professor of mechanical engineering at Adelaide University and the head of the Centre for Energy Technology. And he'll be talking to you later today, as I said. And uh, uh, Louise Beasley is our admin manager. She's been around um, universities and um, managing technology projects for a long time. And We've, there's four of us running this organisation at this stage. We're actively recruiting for a few other roles and we hope to be up and running and, and in full swing by, by about March next year. So thanks for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about us. Um, I hope it interests you. I hope you can perhaps think about the, uh, the opportunities for the solar industry and to see this as a great new adventure as, as we certainly all do. So thanks very much for your time today. And a nice, <clears throat> nice round of applause from the room here, Susan. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes thank you. So. Okay, great. Now I'm on the camera. Um, so I'm just going to check if there are any questions in the room. Uh, any online? I have one. No? Okay, so great. So I have one, um, Susan. So thank you. Uh, so just for everybody's benefit here, this, this is a solar research conference and it covers all of the different solar technologies. Um, although we're very strong in solar PV, we also have the ASTRI, the Australian Solar Thermal Research Initiative. Um, and uh, we, th this, is, you know, this, this presentation and the next one is uh, based on solar heating and cooling. So it's sort of the other sides of solar to solar PV. Um, it's great to, to be able to see the strengths and the growths and the opportunities in these areas. You can see here that there's a strong focus on process heat and the opportunities there for um, solar thermal. Uh, we had a um, presentation earlier this morning um, from Professor Mark Howden on, um, Susan, on uh, uh, the, the, the significant effort that we have to undertake over the next 10 years to reduce emissions and the work that you're doing is very clear in that space. But one of the issues that came up was um, how, uh, as a result of the big investments we're doing in renewable energy, there's going to be some significant 
curtailment or it could be interpreted as basically as free energy um, for that could be converted to very low cost uh, energy inputs to for industrial processes. Um, and we had a, a brief conversation about whether there were anybody doing any research into sort of, you know, assessing the, the like a merit order, if you like, of, you know, where, which, which industries could best respond to this very low cost of energy. And that's some of that's to do with how flexible the, the um, processes are and the cost of capital, how much capital you can have sitting around for waiting for an opportunity to, to access free energy. Um, is that something that could be would, would be considered under HILT or, or is already in the program? I think the way that we're looking at it is we optimise the, um, the configurations, the energy sources um, for every, um, every plant. They're all going to be different. They're highly bespoke. So there's no reason that if we had um, <laughs> very low cost sources of energy in a particular region, that they wouldn't be of interest. We're working our way through what are they, um, what are the variables? Um, where are the where can the variables be sourced from, and how will they be able to feed in? Because what we want to give companies is the tools and the skills to uh, be able to make those decisions for themselves. And we'll, we'll demonstrate a few of them along the pathway. There's no reasons why that wouldn't be of interest, but don't undersell the opportunity for PV either. There's going to be a large, um, uh, a large push for electrification of, of processing. And we don't know how much, we can't tell you at this point in time, how much that will be, how much we'll be um, looking at developing other, other energy sources to uh, provide heat and how much uh, we'll be providing it through electrification, uh, providing the, uh, the energy source for, for high temperatures for electrification. So don't discount any of that. Um, we're just finding our feet. It might be a good question to ask Gus uh, this afternoon too, because um, Gus would certainly have given a lot of thought around where he sees the merit order for energy sources uh, will come from. Okay, great. Thank you, Susan. So are there any other questions? If not, um, I'd like to take this opportunity. To thank you again, Susan, for presenting. That was very interesting. We look forward to some, um, some near-term successes, uh, given the urgency of the, uh, the situation. So thank you very much, Susan. Thanks, Renata. Enjoy the conference. Thank you.